So welcome back on our last but not least today for lectures. Please welcome on stage JB Reinsberger. Thanks very much and welcome to the Canadian stage. Uh, Joe, <laughs> Joe, Joe works as a trainer and mentor to software developers professionals. He is TDD trainer and practitioner. Commonly with his deep programming knowledge and experience, he has a lot of experience with helping organization to be more agile. Uh, JB is also a barist and a five-pin bowler. So you can ask him what the five-pin bowl, bowl, bowling is. Yeah. Yeah, but returning to our speech, uh, we will share with... He will share with us experience with refactoring to unlock its Avison power. All right, are we ready to go? Yeah. All right, wonderful. Welcome, everyone. Thanks very much. Um, yes, so uh, here's how you can find me. And uh, just depends on which of those various services you feel the most comfortable with. And uh, at any time, if you think of a question, but you don't want to ask it now, or you think of a question and you want later and you want to ask it, please always feel invited to go to ask.jbrains.ca. Ask me a question anytime. I cannot make guarantees about the speed of the reply, but I do read and reply to everything. So where we're going to start today is in this position. So many programmers, when they are there are many programmers out there who have this vague feeling like refactoring is something that would be valuable. Refactoring is something that they should do. And especially they use the word should, which I don't recommend, but we are humans and that's normal for us. But we never really feel comfortable to make a big commitment to making refactoring a central part of the way we practice building software. And what tends to happen is we get stuck in this loop where we think, ah, some refactoring would be helpful now. I don't feel comfortable enough to do it, so I'll try again next time. And of course, we all know that next time never happens. And so what I'd like to do is to make a case, make an argument in favor of deliberate practice. This is one of these uh, buzzwords that became, or buzz phrases, I guess, that became popular in the decade of the 2000s and earlier in 2010s with books like The Talent Code and Talent is Overrated. And, and there was this emerging field of, um, of study inside psychology that really tried to analyze and understand how should we practice effectively? What does it mean to practice effectively and how does that work? And deliberate practice is something which is very slowly becoming more socially acceptable in wider society. But we're still having trouble applying these ideas to software development. And that's really what I want to talk about today. What I want you to do by the end of this talk, I'm hoping that you will have a little bit of a feeling like you can practice deliberately, not only because you want to become a master, because you want to be better at a skill, because you want to refactor more accurately or more safely, but in part because this allows you to become what I call the selfish team player. The selfish team player is the person who invests in increasing their own capacity to do work, not just to keep it for themselves, but also so that they can give that capacity more freely to other people. There's some elements of psychology and theory of constraints inside here, and we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, I'm told that there is a delay of about 20 seconds. So now I have to insert a joke here about how I'm asking you a question, but giving you not enough time to answer. So instead, what are some common reasons why people don't refactor more? Well, sometimes they don't refactor. Actually, let me, let me share with you a model of motivation that I learned nearly 20 years ago from someone that I respect a lot, Dale Emery. Motivation is an interesting question. We just had a discussion on Facebook with uh, Jurgen Apollo about is it possible to motivate other people? And what does that even mean? And the way I learned it was this. You can imagine, you can picture in your mind a friend, someone that you care about, and they should do something. Lose weight, learn to swim, learn to drive, blah, blah, blah. 
and they don't do it. And you don't understand why they don't do it. So this is a question of motivation. Why will someone not volunteer to do something, which is obviously a good idea? We're getting some answers here now. And in trying to understand someone's motivation, there's three questions to ask. Do they know what to do? Do they know what will happen if they try? And do they want those things to happen? And if one of those things is missing, there's a very, uh, there's a very strong likelihood that they will not do that thing. Motivation seems to require three ingredients. I know how to get started. I know what will happen. And I want that to happen. And so you can imagine taking a look at some of these answers. Fear. Fear of what? Fear of I don't know what to do. Lack of knowledge and skill. Um, lack of time, which is I don't know what will, uh, I know what will happen and I don't want it to happen. Unrealistic deadlines, underestimates, these are all the same thing. One of the things that you can do to uh, uh, analyze all these answers is to think about it through this model of I don't know how to get started, I don't know what will happen, or I don't want that to happen. So it's too hard, it will take too long, I don't have enough time, I don't trust my skill. Um, management lacks understanding, so we don't agree on the value of refactoring. I wrote an article uh, 10 years ago called The Eternal Struggle Between the Business and the Programmers, which became a talk for which I've become known called Seven Minutes and 26 Seconds. So if you want some answers in that direction, go search YouTube for Seven Minutes, 26 Seconds. So thanks very much for the answers you've provided so far. Here's a common pattern that I've noticed. So. I work with a programmer and I ask them why they are not refactoring more. And they say, well, I don't know how to refactor this code. So we're, we're pairing, we look at some code, I suggest some refactorings and they feel nervous. They don't want to do it. And they say, well, I don't know how to refactor this code. Maybe I know where the design should go and I could just make a replacement and substitute the new one in place of the old one but I don't know how to get there from here to there in all of those nice incremental refactoring steps that Martin Fowler talks about in his book, right? Part of the art of refactoring is to be able to go from here to there in 37 steps, each step keeps all the tests running and each step is reversible. If I decide this was a bad idea, I can take three steps back and it's no big deal. And that's one of the things that people have a lot of problem with. It's very, it, it's, it's relatively easy to know that I want the design to go there and to jump there in one step, but it's much harder to get there in 37 steps, which I can undo and go this way and undo and go that way and so on. And so the programmer looks at that and thinks, I, I can't do it. I, and, and what they really mean is, I don't think it would be a good idea to try to do it today. Maybe I will be able to do it in the future, but today I do not trust myself to do it effectively enough. And normally what they think of is, if I try, I will go too slowly. Somebody will yell at me. My task won't be done on time. I'll have to make some awkward excuse tomorrow why I didn't finish, blah, blah, blah. And when they start to think this, they get into this. It starts to get a little bit darker. I can't afford to try to refactor this code because if I do, I will go too slowly. But if you keep saying to yourself that I cannot afford to try to refactor this code, then eventually you will say this terrible phrase, I will never trust myself to refactor code. Now that's bad, but it gets worse. As soon as you start repeating to yourself, I cannot afford to try to refactor this code. I can never try to refactor code. It starts to get much darker. I will never trust myself to refactor code. I will always have to live with the problems in this system's design. If we don't make good design decisions at the beginning, we will never be able to refactor away from our bad decisions and we will be prisoners of bad decisions. And if you repeat that often, to yourself, uh, often enough to yourself, eventually you will say, I will never be able to do good work here. Whatever good work means for you. Probably building nice design systems is part of, building, is part of doing good work. I will never be able to do good work here. And by the way, it's a very short step from there to, I will never be able to do good work. I am incapable of learning how to do this well. I am incapable of mastering my craft. Why the hell do I even try? Learned helplessness is what's happening here. People are learning 
to believe that they have no influence over the outcome. That's very bad. Now, the good news is we can fix this. And part of the reason, part of the way that I think people can fix this problem is by understanding better how they learn so that they can feel more comfortable with the second part of the motivation model. If you have more of a picture, if you have a clearer picture of what will happen, maybe you will feel more motivated to try. Chunking is a concept from psychology, from specifically cognitive psychology, the psychology of learning and the psychology of thinking. As you practice doing something, you chunk. Chunking is the act of taking something which used to be 10 parts or 10 steps and shrinking it to one thing in your own mind, where you don't have to think about all the details anymore. And as this happens, you perform the steps of a sequence or you think about the parts of a script more fluidly and with less effort. It's really important to understand that this is not about speed. This is about ease, about less effort, about less conscious effort, about burning less energy to do the same work. And speed is a side effect. And by the way, repeating, practicing by repetition and chunking happens at various levels of our thinking about software development, about software design specifically. And I've called these nano steps, micro steps, moves, and strategies. Not all these words are my invention. I take the word move from uh, my good friend, G. Paw Hill. And nano steps are like the tiniest steps that you can make inside your IDE or inside your editor. Chunking happens starting with repetition. Repetition leads to ease and ease leads to chunking. So if you repeat something often enough, it becomes autonomic. Autonomic is just a Latin word for it happens on its own. It's not quite automatic. You still have control over it. But when you decide to do it, the steps happen without conscious effort. It's as though the back of your mind takes control and your fingers just do the right thing. And that happens by repetition. It can happen in other ways, but repetition is a repeatable way to get there. And as you repeat often enough, when things become autonomic, then you chunk and you stop thinking of doing 10 nano steps and you start thinking of doing one micro step. You stop thinking of doing four micro steps and you start thinking of doing one move. And maybe more important than ease or speed is this point. As you chunk, less of your working memory is involved in doing the job, which means that there's more space in your working memory to think at a higher level of abstraction. It's the difference between having to pay attention to every step that you take when you walk and then suddenly being able to think about which direction should I walk. Should I go this way, then this way, then this way? That's what I mean by thinking at a higher level of abstraction. And you get there by the most boring way possible. Repetition leads to ease, leads to chunking. And you can pretty much do this forever. As far as I'm aware, there is no limit to how much chunking we can do. You will never run out of brain space before you run out of breath. You will die before you put too much in your mind. So practice as much as you can. Now, again, 20 second pause. So let me blab for a while. Think about some things that you do easily now, things that don't require conscious effort, but that you had to learn how to do. And I'll give you some really simple, stupid examples like walking. I'll bet you nobody in the audience remembers how hard it was to learn how to walk. But now you walk without thinking. In fact, it's even worse. If you go into the hallway now and you try to walk by paying close attention to every step, by paying close attention to causing your muscles to contract, you'll fall over. You lose your balance. If you've ever tried walking meditation, you know what I mean. There are certain things that not only did you learn to do them easily, but if you try to think about the details now, it's almost impossible to do. And so we've all had this experience of struggling to do something and then eventually feeling like I don't have to think consciously about doing it. I just do it and now I can think about something higher level. 
Driving a car is one of the most common examples. I don't drive. I've never driven a car legally anywhere in the world. I've driven a car twice illegally. We won't talk about that. But I hear stories of people who drive home and don't remember driving home. That's an example of chunking, of autonomy, of autonomy in that sense of making things autonomic. Right, cooking your favorite dish. As Mikhail said, I'm a barista at home. I'm the one who does the coffee. And I can pull two shots of espresso and not think about how to do it. And it's just nine minutes of movement. And at the end, there's two cups of espresso. And if I am interrupted in the middle of that action, I forget where I am and I have, and I, I, it takes conscious thought to think about it. It's amazing to me if you are interrupted in the middle of doing something which was autonomic to then realize how easy it is to be thrown off that you get interrupted and you lose your place and you have to start again. So I hope from this list of stuff, you'll recognize that you were able to learn a bunch of things and they have become autonomic. Refactoring can be the next thing. So if you're familiar with this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, then you know this model of system one and system two. System one is back here, system two is up here. Chunking is the same as saying that system two delegates or hands off an action to system one. And the nice thing about system one is it's always on, it's always working, it has amazing capacity and it's really fast and it's really good. Whereas system two has trouble remembering more than seven things. And the idea of chunking is that we take some routine tasks and we move them to system one so that system two can think about strategy and judgment and that kind of good thing. So here are some examples of how you chunk when you refactor. Let me be very clear. Nobody progresses from the top to the bottom in an orderly fashion. It's chaotic. You practice some things, you repeat some things, and gradually you start to move down the, the model from the top to the bottom, but it never happens in a straight line. So these are just a bunch of examples of things that we do that are part of designing software using refactoring as a central strategy. And near the top of the list, we are focusing on how to refactor safely and effectively and accurately. And as we move down to the bottom of the model, we're we are no longer worried about that so much, but we are more thinking about refactoring effectively. Will this refactor sequence of refactorings get me to there? And so if you notice things on here that feel easy and things on here that feel difficult, and let me say it differently. If you notice things here that you do autonomically, and things that you do that require conscious effort, that's important. So here's a simple example. Let's describe a move. So you are generalizing the design because you're adding a feature and there's a function that used to take a single item parameter, like a single string or a single number, and now it needs to accept a collection of strings or a collection of numbers. How do we do that safely? Well, so here are some micro steps. First, go to everyone who calls the function. So this, by the way, is an instance of Kent Beck's template where he says, add the new thing, migrate the clients, then remove the old thing. It's safe. We're optimizing for safety, even if it requires extra steps. And what I really want to emphasize is that if you practice the steps enough, then the extra steps will be worth the effort, that the safety will stop you from making mistakes and the cost of mistakes dominates the cost of doing this. The most important way to save time and energy and money refactoring is to avoid mistakes. That's the simplest thing you can do. If you practice the same steps every time, you'll make fewer mistakes. So first you change everyone who invokes F and you pass the same data in as a single item and a list or a collection. Then you go inside the function and everywhere you talk to the item, instead you talk to the first item in the list. And you do that until it works. And then the problem is that everywhere that you pass in a list is fine, but the function assumes that every list only has one item. No problem. Next, change all the invokers. I don't have to pass in the single item anymore because I can pass in the list. And then go inside to the function and say, everywhere that I am assuming that there's one item in the list, let me now change that to iterating. And this step four is the place that requires the most thought because 
Maybe the return of the function is a string. So maybe the right answer is to iterate over the list and join all the strings together. Or iterate over the list and join all the strings together with a new line. Or iterate over the list and find the first string that isn't null. That might require a bit of thought. What's important is that when you practice these micro steps, practice the same sequence of four micro steps every time until the four micro steps are autonomic. You don't have to think about it. Repetition leads to ease, leads to chunking. So perform the micro steps in the same sequence every time. And then as that becomes easy, you can pay more attention to the micro steps and say, each micro step is a sequence of nano steps. And the nano steps depend on your text editor, your IDE, your programming language, blah, blah, blah. Then I pick one micro step and I do it as the same nano steps every time. And then I look at a single nano step and I do it the same way every time. If I am used to using a menu item, then I use the keystroke instead. If I'm used to doing it with this long string of, of cocoon commands, then I find a smaller string of cocoon commands. But the important thing is to learn and practice performing each aspect the same way every single time. Make it more similar, more similar, more similar, because the repetition leads to ease, leads to chunking. Now, after a while, you start to notice that in different environments, there's different ways of doing the same refactoring, and your IDE might make this path easier. So instead, we go into F, and the first line of F is, let me declare a collection, and let me put the, el the element into that collection. And then let me do what I was doing before, but the last step will be, now that the rest of the function is using the collection instead of the single item, the last step is to do extract parameter on the collection, and IntelliJ IDEA will replace the item with a collection. It'll essentially do step one and step three for me. So this is one example of just how the tools you use can affect how you practice the steps. But once you see a sequence of steps that will lead to success, practice doing it the same way every time. The secret is in practicing it the same way every time, even though at the beginning, that's boring and slow. The one thing that I've noticed the most about evolutionary design and test driven development in particular is that it always feels slow while we're, while we're doing it, but we always get done sooner. Interesting. There's no rush. Pick something that you need to practice. Pick one way to do it. Repeat that until that feels easy, until it feels autonomic. When it starts to feel boring, then try a different way of doing it or an optimization. Find a shorter sequence of commands. Find a different way of doing it in the IDE. Play around with it. But give yourself a chance. Step three is the most important part. And maybe is the part that makes, the pe makes people the most uncomfortable. Wait until it becomes boring. That's really, I think most programmers underestimate the value of repeating something until it becomes boring. They think that when it becomes boring, something is wrong. I think something is right. That's the point where it becomes autonomic, where you start to chunk. It needs to become a little bit boring. That's a sign that you have been chunking. Now, it gets even better than this, as if that wasn't enough. So repetition leads to ease, leads to chunking, but chunking leads to confidence, leads to courage. When you let yourself chunk, you don't just get better at it. It doesn't just get easier. What happens when something gets easier? Well, you have the feeling that success is more certain. And that reduces your resistance to trying. So now things really get good because you will look for more opportunities to refactor, which will cause you to practice more and chunk more. And you create a virtuous cycle. You create a positive feedback loop of happiness. Not only that, it increases your confidence to refactor. So at the beginning, what happens is you refactor more often. Your success becomes more likely. You refactor more often when success is likely to happen. And then that starts to get boring. And then you start trying to refactor when it's harder. But you feel more hope. You feel more confidence. You feel more like, I will be able to get from here to there. I don't even know what 37 steps there will be. In fact, the amazing thing that starts to happen 
when you experience this confidence and courage is that you have the feeling that if I just start doing a little bit of refactoring from here and I take the first three or four steps, it's like you're walking along a road and it's very foggy and you can't see where the road is leading and you don't know what the destination is. And it's like someone is constructing the road just 10 meters in front of you, but you keep walking with the confidence that the road will appear. And if you walk far enough down this road, then the fog will clear and you will see the beautiful little village, which will be the destination you want to reach. When you let yourself chunk, it reduces the resistance to try, which causes you to go through this virtuous cycle, which leads to having the courage to refactor even when you're not sure it's going to work. That's called hope. When you feel comfortable refactoring and you start removing duplication or you start improving names, even before you know it will work, even before you know the result will be better, 90% of the time you'll be right, 10% of the time you'll be wrong, and the 90% of the time when you're right saves a lot of time and energy to compensate for the 10% of the time that you're wrong. And what changes over time is the number of times that you're right. That just increases and increases and increases. That's when the benefit, when your skill really follows that exponential curve, that it's not this long, tedious part of the beginning, but the part where it really starts to get good. Now, programmers specifically, and maybe software development professionals in general, including project managers and other people who are involved in software development, have this really strange notion that they should perform all the time. I don't know of any other serious professional pursuit where they only perform and they never practice. In sports, they practice. In theater, they practice. In school, we practice. Everything else, we practice. If you only perform, how do you ever get better? Well, you only get better by accident, or you practice on evenings and the weekends, which frankly is nonsense. I have to remind programmers whenever I do a refactoring workout training session that when they are practicing, there is no expectation that they will improve the code. And in fact, in my training course, Surviving Legacy Code, the, the design techniques that we talk about and the testing techniques that we talk about don't even have the benefit of improving the design. What they have is the benefit of increasing options to later benefit, to later improve the design, right? Often when we're dealing with legacy code, we get stuck feeling like I'm never going to be able to make this design better. What's really happening is, I know how I want to improve the design, but I don't feel safe trying. And a lot of the practice that we do, we're building the skill to increase the options that later on we can use to actually make the design better. And especially if you're doing practice like the thing I just described, well, you're probably not gonna improve the design when you practice. You practice so that the moves and micro steps feel more autonomic so that when you do them under the pressure of a real job where you get paid real money to make real results happen, you feel more capable and you're safer, more accurate, more effective. Most of you out there will probably not believe me, but I hate to say it, it's true. You have Slack. I don't mean that silly chat app. I mean excess capacity. You have the time and everybody runs around saying, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. That's nonsense. You're wasting a bunch of time. Stop it. What happens when you practice is you start using your spare capacity more effectively. And that builds an exponential curve of effectiveness. And every time you practice, you build more excess capacity, and then you can use that excess capacity to a little bit of performance and a little bit more practice, and you keep going. And eventually you get to the point where either someone thinks you're practicing too much, like a project manager or a lead programmer or an architect. Fine, it's their money. You have to listen to them. Or you become bored and you find something else difficult to practice. Either way, what ends up happening is you are collecting excess capacity. And after you, once you collect enough excess capacity, 
either you notice that your job is much easier or you notice that you have more time and energy to give capacity to other people. Okay, what should you practice, right? I've just been saying practice, 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 but I, if I don't tell you what to practice, you don't know how to get started. This is what the Heath brothers call scripting the critical first moves. Here you go. Now, I don't know what you, each one of you individually should practice, but I do know how to figure that out. As you are doing real work under real pressure for real money, try to take 5% of your brain power or take a break every 30 minutes and reflect for two minutes while you're drinking coffee, while you're walking around the house, whatever it is. And ask yourself, what did I do in the last 30 minutes that really required me to pay attention? Was it some keystrokes? Was it figuring out which files to commit to version control? Was it um, understanding how to improve this part of the design? Was it thinking about how to replace this low-level interface with a higher-level interface? Whatever it was, if you identify something that requires your conscious attention, that is what you should practice. And I, I don't like to use should, so let me say it a different way. I invite you to consider practicing anything if you notice that it requires your conscious attention. That's really the easiest way to understand what you should do. If you notice that something requires conscious attention, that is a candidate for practice. And it doesn't matter what it is. You don't get bonus points for being lower on the list or higher on the list. Nobody cares. I care about you having the attitude, the determination to say, I will pay attention to the areas where I struggle and I will practice those things. Now, how do you practice? Oh, actually, we'll get back to that. Remember that the rewards of practice, of deliberate practice, are ease and confidence. These are the parts that make us feel better, right? Courage also feels nice. Producing better results is something that your employer cares about. That's wonderful. I'm not talking to them right now. I'm talking to you. I'm only interested in what's going to make you feel better right now. It's just us. Ease, confidence, less stress, more confidence, more courage. These are all the things that are the personal wins, the real rewards to deliberate practice. Not just that, but also hope. Hope that I can. Remember the three parts of motivation? Do I know how to get started? Do I know what will happen? And do I want that to happen? Well, with deliberate practice, you certainly know how to get started. And you know what will happen. Repetition leads to ease. Ease leads to chunking. Chunking leads to confidence. Confidence leads to courage. And it's a self-reinforcing positive feedback loop. It's a virtuous cycle. The more you do it, the easier it gets. And the easier it gets, the more you do it. And you keep going and going and going. Refactoring helps me feel confident. So really focusing on my refactoring skill makes me feel confident that I will never be imprisoned by a design decision made previously. That no matter what feature comes next, no matter what they ask me to do, no matter what good ideas we have, we'll be able to change the design to meet that challenge. Now, let's forget about software development for a moment. And let's just think about basic evolution and basic neuroscience, how your brain works. When you do something that your brain likes, your brain floods itself, your nervous system floods your brain with hormones that help the brain remember what path led to success. And that's how refactoring becomes a habit. Focus on refactoring where it's already easy, where you already know how to do it. Focus on doing the same steps the same way every time until it becomes easier. And then try something a little bit more complicated and do the same thing again. Practice the same steps the same way every time until it becomes boring and easy. And as you do this more and more, you will be building up some pathways of success in your brain. And the more success you feel, the harder your brain will try to remember the path to success and another virtuous cycle. Now we're using the brain's strangeness as a benefit. This is how refactoring becomes a habit. Okay. 
So one thing that I didn't mention here, and I'm actually genuinely surprised that I got here, which tells me that there's a slide missing from this presentation. Let me just take two minutes. Is how do I actually plan to practice? So I'll let this sit up here while I'm describing this part. If you want to practice, then you can start because everybody worries that they don't have time. So here's how you start. First of all, you recognize that you're probably wasting time and it might not be your fault. Maybe your employer is forcing you to waste time. There's these weird work systems that cause you to waste time, whatever, whatever, whatever. Don't worry. What it means is that you have the opportunity to start slowly and gradually. So here's what I want you to try to do. Find 30 minutes, either at the end of a task. So if your tasks usually take two to three days, then 30 minutes is a very small part. Or choose 30 minutes once a week. Friday afternoon, just after lunch, Thursday, just before lunch. I don't care. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that for most people, 30 minutes is small enough that if you take that time to practice, nobody will complain. So here's my, here's my challenge to you. Take 30 minutes once at the end of every task or once per week and do one of these kinds of practice. It could be a drill or it could be taking some code and trying to refactor it somehow. And at the end of 30 minutes, so set a timer for 30 minutes, start practicing. At the end of 30 minutes, throw your work away. Because the changes to the code are not important. What's important is that you practiced. And then ask yourself a couple of questions like, did I notice that it started to feel easier? Did I notice that I thought less carefully about each step? Was there a step that it felt like my fingers did without me? And if the answer is yes, that's great. If the answer is no, no problem, you'll try again next week. And keep doing this and pay attention to see whether anybody complains. Do you get an email from your tech lead? Do you get uh, an unfortunate inv invitation to a one-on-one -on -one meeting from your manager telling you that you're going too slow? If nobody complains, then one month later, turn 30 minutes into one hour and try it again. And keep paying attention to see if anybody complains. And one month later, if nobody's complaining, try two hours. You start to get a little bit nervous because two hours starts to feel like a lot of time. But what's important is that you're trying to discover how much excess capacity do you have and you are using it to invest in your own capacity. And if you do this long enough, gradually, the amount of time that you save will pay for your 30 minutes or one hour of two or two hours of practice. And now you're practicing free. You don't have to worry about whether anyone's going to complain because the savings in time, energy, money pay for the practice. And then it funds itself and you can keep going as long as you want. And that's how you can get started. If you're one of those unfortunate people who is in a working environment where even 30 minutes is something that people complain about, Unfortunately, I don't know what to do except practice on evenings and weekends or start looking for the next job. That's a much deeper discussion, and we can have that too. Remember, go back to ask.jbrains.ca if you want to ask me a question about that. We will have some time to take some questions now. But when it comes time to actually try to do this stuff, you have all the information you need to do it on your own. But if you'd like to read more, if you'd like to understand more, um, here are some places that you can go. We have the uh, we not only have the first two links, which are articles that you can read free of charge, but there's also some training opportunities. I'm running a refactoring workout um, workshop as part of the DevTernity conference uh, in December. So you still have some time to join us if you'd like to. It's a six hour long workshop where we do a, a whole bunch of refactoring practice and talk a little bit about theory. So do you know how to get started? Do you have a feeling about what will happen if you try? And do you want that to happen? If you answered yes to all three of those things, then there's a pretty good chance that when you get back to work tomorrow or whenever it is that you get back to writing code, that you'll feel the impulse to find that 30 minutes to practice refactoring. Great. Enjoy. Have fun. Now let's see here. Uh, One thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much for, for your speech. And I love uh, the, the very end when you say that 
you should uh, practice refactoring or practice or just uh, uh, just learn something for your own. It's it's great, and uh, that's remind me one situation. And I, I was working with uh, with a team. They feel they feel that they should do some refactoring, but they said uh, that product owner business people do not allow them yes and uh, i try to convince them that they should convince them to leave some space do you think uh, development team should should convince product owner and uh, business people to leave some that's space? that's a very complex question because the one style of answer would be to say it's not the business person's decision to tell us how to write code. That's why they pay us to write code. But on the other hand, how much do they need to um, protect their capacity to deliver features is a business decision. Yeah. And that's why I wrote this article called The Eternal Struggle Between the Business and the Programmer. And yeah. also why I have this talk seven minutes and 26 seconds, where I start by saying, here is the way that I think refactoring benefits the business. And part of the problem will be that the business thinks that refactoring is only a cost and not a benefit. I think refactoring is a source of profit. And if more business people understood how this works, they would feel less afraid when we refactored. But even if we solve that problem, there will be some times where the business says, I don't need so much production capacity. We just need to produce things. And that's much more difficult because it's very easy for me as a programmer that I don't trust the business people when they say, we don't need you to design carefully now. Because every one of us has had the experience where the business says, it's okay to cut the corners. We cut the corners and then they tell us to turn the prototype into a product and they yell at us because we go slowly. Even though we are paying the interest on the money which we borrowed <laughs> to make the prototype. And so I think there's a feedback loop in here. I think that because the business doesn't understand how refactoring benefits the company, how refactoring generates profit, they have this picture in their mind that they will get a better result sooner if they uh, cut the corners, if they refactor, if they tell us to refactor less. And I think that if we show the business that we are uh, thinking about business needs, then maybe the business people will trust us more when we tell them, no, really, refactoring is a technique that increases profit. Caring about the design and trying to make what we are trying to, in fact, I say it this way. It works really well in English. I have no idea how well it works in Polish. But in English, you can just say, all I'm trying to do is to reduce volatility in the marginal cost of features. Don't you want that? And it's a bunch of finance, economics, you know, jargon that sounds strange coming from the mouth of a programmer. But it really just means when we refactor, we are making it easier to plan what will be the cost of the next feature. You're a project manager. Don't you want that? You're a customer. Don't you want that? Don't you want a safer investment? And they will always say yes. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And what, one of the reasons why uh, I, I couldn't convince the team to, to convince uh, business people, it was super, probably they, couldn't, they didn't know how to convince people. Right. And... Uh, your answer is how, how we should convince the people. Well, so my, I mean, okay. I don't want to be so strong, but my, my best weapon seems to be to build trust by using the language of the business to show them that I am thinking about them, not just about me. Yeah. And that usually gains some trust. So I'll see if we can take some of these questions here, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. All right. So I'm not sure what it means exactly, but yes, there is one aspect of deliberate practice where you could fall in, where you could fall into a hole. Remember, I said that you practice until something becomes easy, where you don't have conscious effort, where it starts to become boring. 
If you stay in the place where it's boring and you never try to go to the next challenge, then chunking controls you instead of you controlling it. Uh, maybe. I mean, the good news, another possibility is that chunking means that you are saving space in your brain. You're using your brain more efficiently. Now the question becomes, what do you do with this extra efficiency? Do you keep it only for yourself or do you give it to other people? And when we are going through a long period where everyone is abusing us, they're asking us, go faster, go faster. I don't care about your feelings. I don't care about your energy. Just produce more, more, more. It's natural in this phase to spend some time saying, forget about you guys. I now have figured out how to survive this job better. I am figuring out how to make excess capacity. I'm keeping it for myself. After some time, that feeling will go away. The wounds will heal. You will feel better. And you will begin to want to volunteer to give some of your excess capacity to your coworkers, to your manager, to the customer, whoever. As far as wasting time in useless repetition, I agree with you. However, 99% of people out there are spending not enough time in repetition instead of too much time in repetition. It's probably good for them to spend a little bit of time doing too much repetition so that they can see what it means too much. Uh, that's an interesting one. I don't know if I have a quick answer. I would say that, uh, oh, yes, I do. I... Uh, Describe, uh, we all know the extract, well, we're not, not all. Many of you know the extract method refactoring, where you take a block of code and you hide it into a function. One of the benefits of doing this is that the code out here gets shorter. And as the code gets shorter, it becomes easier to understand the general workflow of the code. So I have this trick where I set the timer for 20 minutes. I find some long function, 500 lines, 1,000 lines, something. I just do extract method repeatedly, and I don't worry about trying to make the code better. I'm only worrying about trying to figure out what is the high-level workflow. And then maybe I'm making the design worse. Maybe I'm even breaking the code. I don't care. I'm just making some guesses about the high-level design, the high-level workflow. And at the end of 20 minutes, probably I have changed from 1,000 lines to 12 lines. And I have a guess about what is the central workflow of this part of the system. Now that I have that information, I am reverse engineering some of the workflow of the system. Now I can do git reset hard and start again. I now, it's like I have a map of where I think I want to go. Now it's safer for me to try to take some steps in that direction. So that's one way that chunking can help. As you, ex as you extract methods, you are In the beginning, you are buried by details, and it's hard to understand anything, and many people quit here. If you just continue through, every time you extract methods, you are removing some details, and it's easier for you to see the bigger picture. You are chunking. Let yourself do it three or four or five layers before you find the seven lines of code, which is really this thousand lines of code, and that's the seven steps that matter. Now you are reverse engineering the intent of the code. Now you have a direction to refactor. It's not the only way to do it, but it certainly does work well. So I know I only have about one minute. So let's see. Uh, um, there is no uh, nobody else left uh, after oh, your, okay. uh, your speech. So I all think right. we, we could answer all the questions. Okay, then I'll do that. Yeah. So uh, it's better to invest in consciousness. Yes. Uh, simple answer, absolutely yes. One of the strongest benefits of refactoring is that we do not have to make it right the first time, which is good because we never do, right? So it is, it's almost always easier to take the first idea, put it into the code, and then slowly make the idea better than it is to sit there and think very carefully for three months draw the perfect diagram in your mind, and then say, let's build it. We tried that for 30 years and it mostly failed. So one of the real benefits of, of evolutionary design is that I do not need to make the design correct the first time. Now the real power comes when you go to the next step. 
Because if I can always refactor, then I do not feel pressure to make the design perfect the first time, which means it's okay to make the design just barely good enough for this test, just barely good enough for this feature, which means that I can avoid creating a bunch of compl uh, complications that I don't need yet. Because I feel confident that when we add the next feature and I need those complications, it's easier to add. And if it becomes difficult to add for some reason, no problem. Two hours of refactoring and the problem is solved. And yes, it can feel like that two hours of refactoring is slow, but that's because we forget the six weeks of design that we saved in the beginning. Uh, I wouldn't say that chunking is a shoe phase. I would say that chunking is how you move from one phase to the next. Chunking happens at every stage, shoe ha re. What changes is what from moving from shu to ha to re is going up a higher level of abstraction. It's becoming more comfortable with adapting your strategy to meet the circumstances, to meet the situation. That's re. Re is the stage where you can understand the situation, go through your list of techniques, figure out which technique will fit, figure out how to practice the technique in a way that fits the situation, and then you do good things. Chunking happens at every stage. Chunking is how we go from shu to ha, from ha to re. The difference is that in the shu phase, we are practicing very tiny things. At every stage, we are still practicing. What changes is the size of the thing we are practicing. And in the ha stage, normally what we are trying to do is to draw the perfect map of all the techniques and all the rules that if somebody else will follow them, they will lead to a good result. And when we go to re, we finally recognize that drawing that map is never possible, that instead everyone has to draw the map for themselves. And so I think chunking happens at every stage, but it feels different as we go from one stage to the next. And most of what I've talked about so far certainly has been in the context of the shoe phase. But as you raise the level of abstraction, as you think of more and more powerful ideas, practice is the same, but the effect of the practice is what becomes more powerful. And so let's see here. And the last Aha, yes. How you unleash programmers on a team to practice refactoring. Do they know how to get started? <laughs> do they know how to get started? Do they know what will happen? And do they want that to happen? Start there. So if you're, th there's two ways to answer this question. One of them is, how do they unleash themselves? This model of motivation helps. But in terms of how do we actually help them get started, most people need help understanding how to practice. So that's why I have these refactoring workout workshops so that somebody can spend a half a day or a full day to see some examples of uh, things that they can practice. But it all starts with the same thing. It's what I talked about just at the end. First, we have to decide, I am going to we are going to invest time in practicing refactoring. Then we have to figure out how much time can we safely invest in refactoring. 30 minutes once per week, one hour once per week, two hours once per week. Once we agree on those things, then we go back to my point from earlier. What do we do that requires conscious attention? And let's practice that. And if you don't know what that is, then one of the ways that you can discover it is to program together. Pair programming can be useful, not just for all the obvious reasons, but because while you're typing, I can notice what you are struggling with. And I can make a little note in my index card. And this becomes the inbox for what do we practice. Oh. And the beautiful oh. thing is that there is no perfect path. Just start. Don't worry. Just start. If you practice anything, it will almost certainly be better. Even if we go back to the first question, the first comment about, you know, if you notice that you're just repeating things and nothing is changing, then something is wrong. I agree. It will probably take you a long time before you reach there. That's the good news. Great. 
Great. Thank you very much for the good news at You're the welcome. end. Uh, I very like the approach to start something, not to think about it. It's uh, For me, it's very agile. Yes. So thank you very much, Joe. Uh, we were You're happy welcome. to stay here, even if we are running out of, out of uh, time box. Yes, thank you for giving me very, five more minutes. Very interesting what you have talked to us.